Hi everyone, welcome back to our channel. Bex here today to do a quarterly wrap up for you, which is something I have never done in the 11 years that this channel has existed. I have done wrap ups before, don't get me wrong, uh, whether it's for readathons or just other special events that are happening. I've done recent reads videos, but I have never done quarterly wrap ups. This is something that Les does all the time and I've debated doing them because I don't really read enough each month to constitute doing a monthly wrap up, but a quarterly wrap up is just right. I read or completed, I guess, nine books in the first three months of the year. So I will be talking about those nine books here. Five of those books were on my list of 10 books I wanted to read in 2023. So I made a really good dent in that list considering it's the first three months of the year and I'm already halfway through the list. Hopefully I'll actually be able to finish it, but even if I don't, I'm really happy that I was able to read so many of them. It's a good mix of fiction and nonfiction. So if you'd like to hear about what I've been reading over the first few months of 2023, keep watching. The first book that I finished was Complications, A Surgeon's Notes on an Imperfect Science by Atul Gawande. This is medical nonfiction, which is one of my favorite nonfiction subgenres. I've read two other books by this author, uh, Being Mortal, which was a book that I read a number of years ago now and absolutely loved. And so when I found out that Atul had written other books, I was interested in reading them. And I have just randomly had them come into my life at different points. I've also read Better by him and really enjoyed it. This one was his first book and it is my least favorite of the three. I still gave it three and a half out of five. So it's still a good read if you are somebody that enjoys medical nonfiction. The reason I didn't rate this one as highly is because it's very clearly a collection of different pieces that were written for magazines or newspapers, or whatever, and they've been brought together into this one book. And so there were times where things felt either repetitive because he was mentioning something in a different chapter that had already been mentioned in a previous one, which would have made sense if they were separate articles, but that repetitiveness and then also they just didn't really feel they're all connected. There wasn't that flow to it. So I was picking up on this even before I got to the acknowledgements at the end and my suspicions were confirmed that this was really a collection of different articles that were put together into this book. But even though I didn't love how that sort of structure worked out, I still really enjoy and always enjoy the fact that he pulls in patient stories to really illustrate what he's talking about. In this case, because he is talking about how medicine is an imperfect science, there's a lot of discussion about how do you improve medicine uh, while knowing that you need to operate on people or test things on people to see if they're actually going to work and how when surgeons, for example, are switching to a different method of surgery, there is a higher likelihood that the people that are undergoing these newer surgeries are going to have complications and potentially die from those complications. But in the end, the surgery that they are practicing will save thousands more lives. So there's these sort of ethical conundrums that are being discussed in here, but as a whole, the collection wasn't as strong as his other ones. I will absolutely read anything else he publishes. He has one more book that I haven't read yet, so I will eventually get to that, but I would still very much recommend this if this is your kind of jam. I then finished The Seven and a Half Deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle by Stuart Turton. This one was really popular on booktube a few years ago, and I borrowed this book for my sister because it was one of those ones where if it was put in my lap, I would probably read it, but I wouldn't really go out of my way to check it out. This one is a murder mystery. It takes place in one location and the main character that you're following wakes up on this manor estate and has no memory of what has happened and basically has to figure out what is going on. The only thing they really know is that they're not in their own body. They uh, know something is off. And so from that 
moment you are with that character trying to figure out what is going on and when they do figure out a little bit about what is going on uh, helping them solve this mystery of who kills Evelyn Hardcastle each night. You are following this main character whose name is Aiden but Aiden is inside the bodies of other people that are at this estate when the murder happens. And so you're seeing the same thing or variations of the same thing from different characters' points of view. So it can be a bit repetitive, but if you know that going into it, which I did, it was helpful. I was also told that the beginning is a bit slow because you're very slowly realizing what is happening. And as you gain more and more clues, the pace really picks up. I would agree with that. The thing that I didn't really know going into this was how confusing it could be at times. Because Aiden is jumping into other people's bodies, it's not just one day and then they go to sleep and they wake up and they're in another person's body the next day. It is any time that character goes to sleep, takes a nap, passes out, any of those things, he jumps to another body. Sometimes it was a little confusing to be like, oh, okay, we're jumping back and forth, trying to remember who everybody is. There is a character list at the beginning, which I really appreciated having. I did find it confusing to the point where I kind of gave up a little bit trying to follow what exactly was happening and just sort of let it happen. Happen. And there were also some moments that I don't know if it was my misunderstanding or if they were kind of plot holes in all of this. I do think it's a fun read. It was sitting at a three for most of the time, but then as we got to the end, things really ramped up and there was also some choices that the author made in terms of the plot that I really liked. So this ended up at a three and a half out of five. This is not one that I would recommend to everybody, but if you are into the idea of a locked door mystery and you like the idea of kind of seeing the same day from different people's points of view and learning what's going on and like gathering those clues to solve the mystery uh then this is definitely something you would enjoy uh but yeah it is just be aware that it can be a little confusing at points. Third, I finished a book that has been on my TBR pile for a long, long time, and that is Inferno by Dan Brown. I did have the physical copy, but I ended up listening to this on audiobook because I knew it would be the kind of thing that would be fun to listen to because the books are all always so fast paced. And someone had also recommended that I do that when I was talking about the fact that I just wanted to read this book, but I didn't necessarily want to sit down with this this massive hardcover copy and sit there and read it. And so whoever that person was who commented that probably like two years ago now, I took your advice and I listened to it on the audiobook and it was definitely worth it. So this is the fourth book in the Robert Langdon series. Many of you, if not all of you, will be aware of The Da Vinci Code, which is the book in this series that became a worldwide phenomenon. Like everybody was reading that book. So this is in that series. This takes place after those events, but they don't really tie in too much. You can read the books pretty separately and still get what's going on. Dan Brown definitely repeats certain, certain things about Robert Langdon as a character multiple times in the same story, so even if you don't know anything about him and you're going into book number four, you can kind of pick up what's going on. In this one, Robert wakes up in a hospital. He has no memory of the past few days. He assumes he's in the hospital in the US, but he's not. He's actually in Florence, Italy. And so there are these events that have happened over the last couple days that you don't know about, Robert doesn't know about, and you're slowly finding out what happened together. He has been attacked and he ends up having to escape out of this hospital with one of the doctors there who becomes his female sidekick. The two of them then have to team up to solve all of these mysteries, riddles, puzzles that have to do with different things related to Florence and Dante's Inferno. The thing that I do really like about the Robert Langdon books is that there is so much art and history and interesting science, mathematical things. What I really don't like about Robert Langdon's stories is that he always has some sort of female sidekick and she's always like young and attractive and there's, you know, maybe something there, maybe something not with Robert and it just, it gets tiresome. I'm tired of hearing about it. It's just the way he writes 
his female characters. Sienna is the attractive sidekick in this one, but there also are a few other women in the story. And just the way he describes them gives us a bit of their background. I just don't like it. I think my tolerance is already quite low. And so anytime he touches on a particular fact about the character and the way he presents it, I just, I don't have any patience for it anymore. So I don't plan on continuing the series. There is at least one more book that's already published. I'm not gonna bother at this point. So I still had fun with this to a degree. There were some twists and turns towards the end that I did not see coming and I thought they did elevate the story. But in terms of how the character characters are written and sort of the general plot of what you expect to happen. It's pretty typical at this point. I kind of know what's happening. It's just like the individual bits and the particular pieces of art or history that are talked about that really kind of adds the excitement to it. So yeah, I'm, I'm done with this. Three stars. It's all right. Certainly wouldn't push anybody to read it if they're not interested. Then I finished Hood Feminism, Notes from the Women That a Movement Forgot by Mickey Kendall. This is a book that I actually started reading towards the end of November last year, and it took me until February 1st of 2023 to finish it. And that's not to say that it was a bad book or anything. It just was talking about a lot of serious topics and using a lot of lingo that you really had to focus when you were reading it. And I was just, not in the mood to read a book like that for a lot of the time. So it took me a little bit longer to read it, but I did put a lot of tabs into it because there were a lot of things in here that I found interesting. This talks about how white feminism has really left behind other women who aren't middle class, rich, and white. And kind of going back to the basics of what feminism means, like accessibility to food and healthcare, education, just the very, very basics and how we still have a lot of work to do in those areas. Most of the things that this book touched on, I had read something about in other books. So I would consider this a pretty beginner book. The language that she uses is a bit more elevated, uh, the terms and whatnot. I did have to look a couple things up just to get clarification on what did I think it was versus what was it actually. And so in that way, it's maybe a little bit more elevated than a beginner book. Uh, what I really liked in this, the particular chapter about reproductive rights and the intersection of that with disability. That was something that I had not read about in any other book that I could recall, and I immediately wanted to read more on that subject. So if anybody watching this video happens to have recommendations for books that focus a bit more on reproductive rights and the intersection of that with disability, please let me know what those books are down below because I'd be very interested in checking them out. There was one quote that stuck out to me that I put in my Goodreads review, and that is, no one has ever freed themselves from oppression by asking nicely. And that just really stuck with me because although it has been said before in different ways, it was just a nice reminder. Because when the side that you're fighting against is making comments like, oh, you're not being respectful about this, like you need to go about this this particular way for us to even consider listening to you. It just makes me so mad because anybody who's been in any sort of situation like this where they are being oppressed couldn't just go up to somebody and ask to be, you know, brought out of that situation, taken out of that situation. You had to fight for it. And that's not always going to be a nice experience. I would recommend this book to people who are looking for some more basic information and maybe pushing themselves a little bit into the next level of discussing feminism and what that looks like in society today. Just know that it might not be the kind of book that you want to read after a long day at the office. This book was the book that I was looking forward to reading this year in terms of books I already had on my shelves. It was a book that I immediately knew was going to be in my 10 books for 2023, and that is Personal Effects, What Recovering the Dead Teaches Us About Caring for the Living by Robert A. Jensen. The unfortunate part is this book was so poorly edited, there were so many misspellings, words missing, weird phrasing, commas and just the grammar was all over the place that I couldn't enjoy it. Robert A. Jensen is the chairman of one of the largest disaster management companies in the world. And when you think disaster management, you might be thinking about 
the people that go in to help when there is a large disaster like 9-11 or the 2004 tsunami. That is accurate. That is what Robert and his co-workers, colleagues do. His company is on retainer for a lot of large airlines. So if there is a plane crash, he and his colleagues will go to the location. They will uh, catalog everything, the bodies, the items, the plane itself, and they will help get those bodies and those things back to the loved ones of those who died. So it's a very, very serious business, but there's a lot to be learned from this. And I thought he would have an interesting perspective on life and like what it's like to run a company like this. And that is true, but the impact of what he was saying was greatly reduced by the fact that I couldn't get through a page of this book without there being some sort of spelling mistake, grammatical error, whatever it may be. It was so bad. I'm not exaggerating when I say every two pages there was some sort of issue that was big enough that I would notice it. There's probably things I didn't even catch. So I don't know where the editors were on this project, but this book should not have been published in this state. I don't know if it was a mistake and this accidentally went to print and they didn't mean to, but he thanks his editors and other people at the back of the book. And I was like, these people do not deserve your thanks because no. Like he's not a great writer, but it would have elevated the book a lot more if the editing wasn't so poor. I gave this a 2.5 out of 5, which is probably a little generous at this point, but just because the stories that I got in here were what I was looking for. You do get to hear about the stories that you would expect uh, regarding big events like 9-11, Oklahoma City bombing, different uh, major plane crashes that people have heard of. But there was also a couple stories in one chapter that were very complicated because they happen in very remote areas. One of them was in Peru and and then the other one was in Angola, I believe. And just the amount of work and research that needed to be done to safely get their people in and out to help was really impressive. I cannot recommend this book just because of the quality in which it was printed. It would be interesting to see if the uh, audiobook has as many issues in it because there are times where there are just words blatantly missing from sentences. So I'm curious to see if that was fixed in the audiobook. But mm, it's just, I'm just really, really disappointed. If I happen to make like a most disappointing books video, this would definitely be on it. I also finished The Voyage of the Dawn Treader by C.S. Lewis. This is the third book in the Chronicles of Narnia. It's the third book that was published. It's technically the fifth chronologically, but I'm rereading the series in publication order. And for these three, I have done a book to movie comparison. So if you're somebody that has seen the first three movies that came out in the mid to late 2000s, it was 2005, 2008, 2010. I have deep dives uh, comparing the book and the film, including this one. So I'll link this one because I just did it. This story still features some of the Pevensies, but it only features Edmund and Lucy, and then they're joined by their cousin Eustace, and they're swept into Narnia through a painting in Eustace's house, and they end up getting picked up by Prince Caspian, who's now King Caspian technically, on his ship the Dawn Treader, and they are sailing as far east as they possibly can from Narnia to visit different lands, inhabited, uninhabited, and you just go on this journey with them as they're sailing on this ship as far east as they can possibly go. They're joined by Reaper Cheap, who was also in the previous book, and of course Aslan makes some appearances. And I've just really enjoyed the adventure in this book. This is my favorite of the three books published so far. I gave this a three and a half out of five. There was a little bit of cheese at the end with Aslan, like it does get a bit religious-y towards the end, as these always do, but I found this one took a bit longer to get into that side of it. And I appreciated that because I don't read these books for the religion. I'm just reading them as an adult again to 
see how I feel about them now. And yeah, the adventure in this one really appealed to me. And I'm going to keep going with the series, even though I won't be making book to movie comparison videos anymore. And we'll see if any of those get better. But this could be the peak of the series. I then finished another audiobook, and that was Heartland, a memoir of working hard and being broke in the richest country on earth by Sarah Smarsh. Sarah grew up in Kansas, so this story is based there and she does narrate the audiobook. The thing about this one is it had been on my list for a really long time and I was looking for audiobooks that weren't too long and so when I was scrolling through reviews on Goodreads people were saying how this book is a bit weird in the sense that she writes this book to her unborn daughter. The thing is she doesn't actually have a daughter, at least as of the publication of this book. She did not have a child, so it wasn't like she was pregnant and she was writing to a baby that was coming. It was like she was writing to the baby that she never had because what this book discusses a lot is poverty, the cycles of poverty, and one of the key points that gets brought up a lot is that her mother, her grandmother, they all had kids when they were very young and so it was hard for them to survive at times. They're dependent on a man who maybe doesn't have the most stable job and or maybe this man abuses them or maybe he drinks a lot and sort of how they would end up in similar situations uh, not only her mom and her grandmother, but other members of her family. And so one of Sarah's main goals was to not get pregnant before she graduated high school and went to university. And so I think that's why she's writing this book to her daughter that she could have had had she ended up in the same situation as the rest of the women in her life. And so I knew this going in, that this was going to be a theme. So it didn't throw me off as much, but there were definitely times where she would say, you, but she clearly wasn't talking to us as the reader, she was talking to her unborn daughter. I just loved hearing about her life and her her story and her focus, uh, particularly whenever she talked about her grandma Betty. I found her grandma Betty fascinating. And so you're you're getting her life story, but she's relating it back to what's happening in, you know, economically in the US at the time. I think my only critique with this, other than the fact that she mentions the unborn daughter thing, is that she has a brother Matthew and I felt like he got mentioned a lot towards the beginning of the story and then she sort of drifted away from talking about him because she talks about her mom, her dad, her grandma, her grandparents and I feel like her brother just kind of faded into the background and we never really heard about him again after she was young and so I don't know if maybe that means that their relationship isn't as tight as it used to be or something but it just felt weird to me because she did take the time to focus and talk about the histories of everyone in her family and then her brother just kind of disappeared. Even despite the weirdness of the talking to your unborn child, addressing your unborn child in the book, I did end up giving this four out of five stars. Second to last, I finished my first five star read of the year, and that is To Be Taught If Fortunate by Becky Chambers. I heard lots of different people talking about this on booktube, and it always sounded like something I would really enjoy. And I'm happy to say that I know my reading tastes and this book delivered because damn, this was so good. <laughs> this book follows Ariadne who is living in the turn of the 22nd century. So not like a super distant future, but a little bit of a ways from now. And astronauts at this time are now able to travel great distances and research and check out other planets and moons and see what other life is out there. So Ariadne and three other astronauts are on a particular ship together and they are in sort of a cryo sleep and when they arrive at their destination the ship wakes them up. Although they feel like they've only been asleep for a second it's been you know years and years and so back home earth is very different. It takes ages and ages for messages to travel from their ship back to Earth. So they're basically on their own, but they have their objective to travel to these different planets and do research and send that research back to Earth. It's even hard for me to explain why I love this book so much, 
but just the way it was written, how realized the characters were, and the situations that they were dealing with, how they dealt with them, it just made sense. It gives you that feeling of you're in space, you're kind of alone, you're really having to depend on the people around you and like what that does to you while you're also exploring these new places that no human has ever been to. It's just you're balancing these really cool, amazing things with the idea of just being human and missing home and human connection. and. Oh yeah, I just, I loved it so much and I don't think I could ever properly explain why, <laughs> why this book just works so well for me, but I know there are other people out there that love this and so you will at least understand what I am trying to express here, but I will absolutely be reading other things written by Becky Chambers. The final book that I read in quarter one of 2023 is A Mind Spread Out on the Ground. This is written by Hood Nishoni author Alicia Elliott, and she also narrates the audiobook. So I had two audiobooks this quarter that were uh, narrated by the authors, and both of them did excellent jobs. Would highly recommend listening to the audiobooks if you're an audiobook person. It is a memoir, but it's written in essays. Some of the essays are very focused on her life, and some of them focus on greater things about like Native rights, legacy, depression, lots of different things. And then she kind of relates it back to her particular upbringing. In terms of the essays where Alicia really focuses on herself, she talks about how she was born to an indigenous father and a white, very Christian mother, and how tumultuous their relationship was. She talks about the many siblings that she has and sort of growing up in poverty, having to move between the US and Canada, living on the Six Nations Reserve for many years, and not having running water, having head lice for years and years and years, and how all of these things affected who she is today. There was an extra element that I liked in this book because Alicia is talking about a lot of places near where I live. I live in Southern Ontario. Alicia also lives in Southern Ontario and spent a lot of her life in this area. And so she's talking about particular locations that even if I haven't been there, I'm aware of them. I know relatively where they are. And so that was kind of cool to have that extra connection, uh, even if a lot of the things she was talking about were very serious. I really liked the particular essay talking about photography and I was wondering how she was going to kind of relate this back to her life or indigenous rights, indigenous history, and she, she did and I was learning things from it that I never read about before or heard about before and so that was really cool. I appreciated getting those deep dives on things that I wasn't necessarily expecting to get. There are some things in this book that could be triggering to certain readers. She does talk about sexual assault. She talks about the murder of Indigenous people. She talks a little bit about missing and murdered Indigenous women, the trials related to that, and so there was a heaviness to it it, because there were things that she was discussing that I'm aware of that have happened relatively recently and you could just really hear uh, and understand the pain that she was feeling. So although this book can be intense a lot of the time, there are parts that are particularly heavy, at least they were for me. If this book is on your radar, I would definitely recommend picking it up. I've already recommended it to someone else in my life who's a reader. And uh, yeah, I gave this book four out of five stars. Definitely worth your time. Those are the nine books that I read in the first quarter of 2023. If you've read any of them as well, please let me know what your thoughts were. If you are already considering reading any of these books and my thoughts influenced you one way or the other, please let me know as well. As always, all of our links are in the down bar. You can check those out if you feel so inclined. Thank you all very much for watching and I'll see you later.